Welcome, everyone. My name is David Wood, and I am co-hosting today's joint meeting between London Futurists, the UK node of the Millennium Project, and Fast Future. And this is another meeting in an ongoing series dedicated to one of the truly most important issues of our time, namely the rise and implications of artificial general intelligence. I'll hand over in a moment to today's speaker, who is Tony Zarneski, the managing partner at the Sustensis Think Tank. Tony will explain a bit about his own background, but what I'll say in advance is that he has some distinctive, challenging, and well-considered ideas on many of the world's most important issues, including the rise of artificial general intelligence. He is the author of at least four books about the future, but his thinking hasn't stopped there. In my experience, Tony constantly revises his understanding in the light of new information and new feedback. Therefore, what you'll be hearing today won't just be his old ideas regurgitated, but rather will be a fresh look at the question of the control of artificial intelligence brought bang up to date with some very recent news announcements. But first, before handing over to Tony, let's hear a few words from today's co-host, Rohit Talwa, the CEO of Fast Future. Hello, everyone. Uh, I guess a few of you know me. Uh, we at Fast Future are futurists. We help people think about the emerging future. And one of the most interesting things we're doing at the moment is working with a big financial services institution looking at a whole range of topics. And one of the fun parts of what we're doing is actually working with Tony uh, to take the questions we're exploring about the future and to run them through uh, an AI tool called GPT-3, which Tony's doing for us. And the insights coming out of that are, are incredible. The, uh, in some cases, they're very, very insightful. In some cases, you can see it's not yet AGI because it's replicating what it's said before and it's not building on it. But it, it's certainly fascinating to see the state of the art. And Tony has become our guru in navigating that. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing what Tony has to say. Just a few words about the Millennium Project. Many of you may know about it. It's been going for something like 30 years now. It's a global collaborative think tank exploring many of the grand challenges for society. Uh, has over 80 nodes around the world. So it really brings together very diverse opinions to create a, a publication every couple of years called The State of the Future, which is a very rich set of data about the emerging future. It has its grand challenges that it identifies and updates on a regular basis. And then it does a number of very in-depth studies. So it did a lot around scenarios around the pandemic. Uh, right now, it's just scaling up a program of research around artificial general intelligence, and in particular, the governance aspects of that. So ask David and myself if you want any more, but if you just type in Millennium Project, you will find uh, all their resources online. So I'm not gonna take any more time. I'm gonna hand you over to Tony because Tony has uh, a really rich presentation to share with us. Thank Tony. you very much, Rohit. Thank you, uh, David, for the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Two months ago, in February, Professor Roman Jampolski had a presentation for the London Futurist on how dangerous is artificial intelligence. My presentation today will be following th that theme, but I'll be focusing on how to avoid the danger of creating a hostile superintelligence, which ultimately may lead to human ex species extinction. <clears throat> if we consider that 99% of all species have disappeared. The question is, why should there be an exception uh, to the so-called Fermi's paradox, which tells me that if there were any civilization in the universe, they would have contacted us. The thing that they didn't contact us may, may mean that they have destroyed themselves or evolved into a new species. So the challenge that we have at the moment, or the choice that we still have, is whether we evolve and maintain the control over that evolution, or whether we become an extinct species, like six other hominids, such as Neanderthal, Denisovan, or Homo florensis. As you may notice, I have added one extra line in this version of presentation, 
trying to make it even more uh, provocative uh, in the style of the London Futurists, because our intention has been, and I'm talking for David and in the name of other <coughs> the predecessors, <coughs> that we want to, to come to the truth, not present just our view or my view, listen to others, so that we jointly come to some common understanding. So the added um, line is, will 2030 be a tipping point for artificial intelligence control? A few words of consensus, I'll skip it because David has already mentioned it, but I'll have to uh, refer to my books, not just to promote it, but to uh, share with you my some kind of bewilderment. When I wrote the fourth book, I looked back and I said, for God's sake, there were just four questions, mega questions that I had asked in the last several years. The first one was who? Who could save humanity for super intelligence? And on, the, on the basis of that, I, uh, I, uh, re, uh, I wrote three uh, books in a series called Post Humans, which were answering three next questions, uh, like steps to control AI, the subject of our debate today. The first one was what? What needs to be done? And the answer was federate. Federate to survive. If you consider what is happening right now in the Ukraine and how the world within the last two months has changed enormously, yes, there is a tragedy in Ukraine and they are really paying with their blood for us to come to our senses that we should be together rather than Brexiting, for instance, from Europe. So that book written several years ago was spot on we need to federate rather than being alone. The next question is, okay, so if we federate, so what next? Almost simultaneously, we need to democratize uh, what we have in mind. We have to do a deep reform of democracy. And the final question was, okay, now we federated, we have uh, super intelligence under control, so what next? Where to? And the answer is, evolve and that was the uh, metaphoric uh, title of my fourth book becoming a butterfly so that has to some extent uh, created an agenda for today's presentation how to control artificial intelligence in three big steps the first one is i have to introduce you to my understanding of ai and super intelligence so that we are on this same wavelength the second question is, what are the methods of AI control? And the third one, how can we deliver that control? I start with the description of artificial intelligence. But before we go there, you may be a little bit surprised that I mentioned, well, yes, for many people, very well known uh, term, information technology, because artificial intelligence wouldn't be uh, here without information technology. So data, processors, memory, interface, communications, and so on. But that is not artificial intelligence. In order to have artificial intelligence, you need at least three more components. These are sensors, neurons, and machine learning. Self-learning, uh, enforced learning, um, and other types of learnings that are all the time being invented. All together, this is artificial intelligence. Now, what is super intelligence? And I use this term rather than, than artificial general intelligence. Uh, I took that from Nick Boston, uh, Boston uh, book, uh, Super Intelligence, of which I'll be talking a bit in a minute. So. To, to get to artificial general intelligence or to super intelligence, we need at least two things. You need a mind, a kind of a mind, as a single entity, and it will need to be a cognitive mind. So it has to understand the meaning of things, uh, about um, even abstract things, 
and not just conversation, but what the objects mean, the relationship between the objects and so on. And it obviously has to be intelligent, super intelligent. But there may be one more component. Scientists do not agree yet whether this is necessary. I am in the camp of those that think that it will come as a byproduct, and that is consciousness. So in my view, we will have a conscious superintelligence within the next few decades. Now, how that superintelligence might be represented, you may ask. In my view, initially at least, there will be several superhuman intelligences. But uh, ultimately, there will be just one single digital mesh-like web, including the satellites, connections, and so on, a faking entity with its mind far exceeding all human intelligence. So don't imagine that it will be a robot like uh, a Terminator. This is, this is uh, long gone and past. This will be an invisible entity to some degree. But how you can actually uh, inter interact with it through its interfaces. So these ones that I mentioned earlier, robots, humanoids, satellite, uh, mobile phones, whatever, that's for us to, co uh, to communicate with superintelligence. It will itself be represented by avatars. Here's an example of a real person and its avatars. So what it means is that it will be able to be present at the same time in many parts of the globe in various forms, like those avatars or humanoids. The best one known is probably now Amica, the best emotional humanoid created by a British company, by the way, and uh, was created just within one year. Amazing feat, amazing. Uh, you can go on the internet and, and test it yourself. And then holograms, and finally, transhumans. And this is the subject that we'll be talking about a lot today. Before we go there, I would like to show you how AI has been accelerating throughout the last 70 years. And I mentioned the so-called AI winter. Yes, we had that one. Um, the optimists in the 50s, after the discovery of a transistor uh, in 1948, and the first three computers that IBM has built, uh, uh, built at that time, there was a euphoria. They were talking about artificial brain, and so on and so on, until early 70s, where we suddenly had a, a, a artificial intelligence winter, the progress was nowhere near until 1997, the big blue and the famous match between Watson, IBM Watson computer and Gary Gasparro. Now I'm going straight to what has really happening in the last 15, 17 years. And the first major breakthrough were the convoluted neural networks in 2006 created by Fei, Fei Li. That is the image uh, recognition. So pictures, objects, and so on. 2016, uh, uh, Google DeepMind delivered uh, AlphaGo, which used the supervised machine learning, and which beat uh, Lee Sado in the, the world master in AlphaGo, a major breakthrough. That thing was tested and trained by scientists by many, many months, millions of iterations. What followed just a year later was Alpha Zero, unsupervised machine learning. Um, an AI agent uh, which taught itself to play any game, and again, it beat any master in the world. 2017, again, you, you can see this is now years, we are talking the same year that a major discoveries were happening. Uh, by the way, when I am talking about AI breakthroughs, I'm not talking about 
uh, exemplification of some new inventions, uh, super robots or platforms. So I'm talking about breakthroughs that impact all AI across all domains. And that's why it's, it's so important. So 2017, we have seen the tokenized self-attention for natural language processing. I, I leave those technical terms. I'm just only mentioning that it was very important. I can see the span. 2021, this was the alpha fold. Uh, instead of tokenizing text, they tokenize graphs. And on, in that, on that basis, predicted the, the protein folding. Absolutely crucial uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and medicine for the very first time. If you imagine that there are theoretically 10 to the power of 300 possibilities for proteins to fold, you understand that the achievement of that is absolutely enormous. In March this year, the French, uh, the Viennese company uh, developed photonic quantum memory stores. Uh, I'll be talking about it later on, uh, just uh, to explain to you that this is like a, a human synapse, right? Which connects uh, dendrites or axons uh, in our uh, neural system. Just one month later, we had a French company delivering white box, self-explainable AI, a crucial breakthrough because until now, we were dealing with black box. So uh, when an intelligent AI develops something, quite often you didn't know how did he get to those conclusions. That was very, very dangerous. So we have passed that stage. Now that was the 2nd April. Two days later, we had Palm, Pathways language model developed by Google Research, which has added to what were previously transformers, the reasoning. This is the first glimpse of a kind of cognition, the elements of cognition. We are still far away from that, but this is a very important breakthrough. Now, to show you even uh, a more impressive uh, breakthroughs, after the AI winter, I use this slide, which shows you uh, how the number of tokens, the parameters uh, in natural language processing, which we may call artificial neurons, but these parameters are not the same as neurons. You need around a thousand parameters uh, to have an equivalent of one human neuron. So within four years, we went from 300 million to 1.6 trillion. And within the next two years, we'll probably have the human level number of neurons. So we'll have roughly 86 trillion neurons. Human brain has 86 billion neurons. So the, the progress in AI uh, in the latest, not just years, months, is, is absolutely impressive. Every week there are some breakthroughs in, in, in various them that in, in impact all the domains. But that does not include the impact of quantum computing and the memory stone neurons, not those ones from Vienna, but the generic term. So the artificial synapses that are on the way. And they will be very critical to miniaturization of artificial intelligence and uh, delivering a more processing power with less current, if you like. So generally, we can say that computers have now an equivalent of 2% of neurons, but unfortunately, you cannot get it for $1,000 yet. Why $1,000? Well, I answer that in a second. So the question is, will there be a human level artificial intelligence by 2030? And here I mentioned Ray Kurzweil probably the world, <clears throat> the world best known futurist who made within the last 30 years around uh, 180 uh, predictions and he was right, 86%. He predicts that we will have human level intelligence by 2029. What people rarely mention is that he meant a single domain, not a general artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence like in a silo, 
uh, for text processing, image processing, um, or, or conversing, or for uh, physical activities. So that's his prediction. Professor Jai uh, Tang, uh, the team leader of the Wudao 2, the uh, most powerful transformer in the world uh, with 1.6 trillion transformer, transformer, says that within the next 10 to 20 years, we'll have a cognitive AI. So he goes even further than Kurzweil. Um, and we may say that it's 2035 that he predicts that we will have a cognitive AI, which is an absolute uh, breakthrough. It would change everything if we get to the cognitive AI. Ray Kurzweil furthermore predicts that we will have a mature superintelligence, uh, that means a full AGI, by around 2045. When he said that for the very first time in 1995, AI scientists said, <laughs> Well, Mr. Kurzweil, you must be off your mind. Well, most of them said it will be there in the next 200 years. Guess what? Today, the difference between the scientists, 370 scientists that did that assessment in 2017, is just 15 years. 50% 50 of them think that we will have a geo superintelligence by 2060. So if we have that superintelligence, it may destroy us, or it can deliver unimaginable benefits and reduce threats. So transhumans, and or other humans if they like, may start fully morphing with superintelligence after 2050. If anybody thinks if anybody feels uncomfortable, say, oh, for God's sake, stop it. Read this. There is no way that we can stop artificial intelligence. It's the same principle as which many people will be su surprised hearing that, that we cannot switch off the internet globally. It's over. We cannot switch off the internet, which is run by independent scientists and technicians, not by the government. So we are, we've already passed that long time ago, around 20 years ago, in, 20, in 2000, we were already not able to switch off the internet. The same is with artificial intelligence. AI may reach human level intelligence, I say, by 2030, and I call it immature superintelligence. Initially, it will have some skills in certain domains, and I list them, for instance, what we have already achieved today, like there is a composer called Iva that com composes music on the level of uh, top performance. Artist Ida that paints paintings worth a million dollar uh, authors uh, that create um, poems using GPT-3 that uh, Rohit mentioned and which I have been involved in. Uh, research uh, in any domain, which is a major breakthrough that happened just uh, two months ago uh, and will be applied by any research in any scientific domain. This will move the science generally uh, with, with enormous speed because instead of having teams of researchers and investigating what is new, they can have the answer within, within an hour on any topic they want. And we already have simple laborers, I call them, so workers like Boston Dynamics Handle, that that's what it says, handles packages in the warehouses in in any dimension and directions, um, absolutely self-driven. Um, there is no, there are no cables, nothing. It just does everything on its own. So these are skills and capabilities that we have to, today, which are almost 100%, uh, and some even more, at, of the AI, uh, of the human level. And then we need to consider the sensory processing. 
So the image recognition, for instance, the clear view uh, a company delivers that with at least 90% accuracy, touching 90%, emotions, Amika mentions. Uh, it's incredible. If you talk with that, and you can go to the internet and see it yourself, it will show emotions in response to your emotions. But it will show it only. There is no feeling. He doesn't know what it says or what, what he expresses, or she expresses, because there are variants of it. But uh, this is how far we are. Smelling, uh, better than humans, the French uh, company uh, Aribales, uh, audio, including translation, and some people using uh, YouTube right now and listening on, on this, uh, to this presentation uh, on YouTube may use the Google Translator that translates perhaps up to 90%. It depends what. It's not yet perfect. But anyway, we are there. So all of this is already today, I, but I give 2030, the immature superintelligence. What it will be missing is cognition and integration of all those skills and sensory processing in one agent, in one thing, uh, which will essentially be invisible. The, this mature superintelligence will be with us by about 2050. So now you may ask, <clears throat> yes, so this is the superintelligence. Now you may ask, how humans fare generally against artificial intelligence right now uh, using uh, perhaps the most um, the most far-reaching um, comparison uh, or, or, or stratification of human intelligences. This is done. This was done by Howard Gardner, and he identifies eight key human intelligences like bodily kinesthetic. Uh, musical, logical, mathematical, interpersonal, intrapersonal, linguistic, spatial, and naturalist. Now, what I've done using available information, this is not a precise science, but uh, very close to that, I would say, is to uh, see where the artificial intelligence is uh, equals the human capability. And obviously, AI is especially a mathematician, so no one is 100% or even more. In bodily kinetics, kinesthetic, uh, you can see what the handle can do. You can see what Boston Dynamics spot the, the dog or the Chinese version does. Um, you can see that they do the gymnastics, as most of the gymnasts. And so. It's around 80%, uh, it's around 90%. Uh, Musical, I, sh I show you an example of a composition, say 80%. Uh, spatial visualizing the world in 3D, you have 90%. And linguistic, which include conversations and translation and so on. Let's say we have 60%, not to go too far. Where we are failing totally, in, in terms of the matching artificial intelligence to our skills is in the area of understanding the living, what it means to be alive, to enjoy the beauty, the nature, and so on. This is a good naturalist. We may say it's just 1%, perhaps, if at all. Intrapersonal, understanding yourself. You need for that cognition, what you feel and what you want. Let's say it's 2%. And the interpersonal, sensing people, feelings, and emotions, not only showing them, but sensing internally. So we have still a long way to go, but perhaps in the most critical that uh, may impact us very quickly and, and most, we are already at the level of 9,100%. Perhaps three of them are equal our skills or superior to us. So once AI reaches human level intelligence, even if it's as it is shown here in a simple single domain, it may be beyond human control. And here I would make such a remark because you may have heard it from IBM and other large companies. Well don't worry. 
will contain artificial intelligence in silos. So they will be only in a single domain. So don't worry, it won't be an artificial general intelligence. I would say this is very irresponsible to say like that. Anybody that knows anything about unsupervised learning means that an AI that learns itself can learn anything. So even if it is for one domain, its knowledge will seep through the borders, if you like, and gradually it will impact other domains. And that has already happened with GPT-3, which can write computer code. But it was invented only to understand text and, and um, communicate with us and, and translate. So, and, and it's going even further. I mean, those who created it, that didn't think that it could do that. Uh, DALI, which is another version of GPT-3, can uh, uh, recognize uh, images and, and videos. So what was originally GPT-3 is now much, much more, although the mechanism behind that remains the same. It's just the self-learning of that thing that goes um, if you like, sideways, and embraces more and more new entities. So 2030 is only a probable tipping point when humans may lose control of AI. But I believe it must be considered as a firm date for the governments to take fast action. Nothing will happen if it is not measured. Why I'm saying that? To give you an example of global warming. We have International Panel on Climate Change, the UN agency. For 30 years, roughly from the Rio conference through to Kyoto, almost nothing happened. The public opinion just shrugged their shoulders and we all went on. Until Paris, 2015. What happened in Paris? They specified the date 2030 by which the uh, overall temperature increase cannot go beyond 1.5 centigrade. And that has done the trick. So now we have most of the government of the European Union forking out 1.4 trillions on climate change, of which some is going on redressing the imbalance in industries and so on. But anyway, gigantic sums because of that. And the same has to be true about the artificial intelligence. So what we need to do is to create or to popularize, if you like, several thresholds for 2030 to say what will happen if no government action is taken. Uh, the first such a measure could be the number of artificial neuromorphic neurons exceeding the number in the human brain. Here's an example of human synapse. Uh, you probably don't see my mouse, uh, but if you look at the left, and on the right, the green one is the artificial uh, synapse, which is now being miniaturized almost to the, to the human level. So you are talking about nano scale. Uh, AI processing speed measured in uh, floating point operations exceeding the performance of the human brain. We are not very far from that. Now, this is the most important. The number of incidents when AI network of globally con connected robots went out of control. Think about Tesla cars, right? Tesla has a center that monitors all Tesla cars. Uh, 24 hours a day, <clears throat> uh, every day. Now, these cars can be spread around the world. On the same principle, there will be companies very shortly that will use AI centers to control production, for instance, or anything else. But as I said, these artificial intelligence centers, like the Tesla Center, will learn new things. By the way, uh, Elon Musk uses, intends to use the intelligence that his autonomous cars have 
to create the most advanced artificial intelligence humanoid. That will be the uh, review uh, later this year. So we are already there. But think that these centers for controlling physical things in worldwide get uh, havoc. Or there is an error, or there will be a malicious intent intended action of, of such a uh, powerful center. What then? I think at that time, if there are several such incidents where you wouldn't be able to switch off such an incident, uh, uh, such an uh, artificial intelligent agent, when the governments may come to their senses and try uh, to get uh, together to put some controls on artificial intelligence. And perhaps equally important is the first simple cognitive AI agent. When this happens, everything, what I said, does really not matter. Why? Because it is possible, it's not certain how fast, but it's possible that it will, uh, through self-learning and self-understanding more and more of what the world is around, it may have enormous uh, power on influencing us. So nobody knows, and I'm not telling you that it will be ready by 23rd or 25th, or perhaps never. There is nobody, uh, because this is so crucial. But there are some people saying that it can be within the next few years. And so what then? So even I would, uh, uh, foolish, saying that we went to 23rd, because it will happen earlier, like with the uh, global warming, which the target of 1.5 uh, centigrade increase may actually be a uh, arrived at area. So that's where we are today. So what are the options of controlling artificial intelligence? I have created uh, three scenarios. The first one, that humans still are in control of artificial intelligence, say by 2030, and this is the tipping point of AI control. And the second period where the maturing superintelligence will start controlling humans after the 2030, roughly. So the first scenario is that there is no global AI control till 2030, which is, in my view, almost a certainty. Because first of all, it has, would have to be effective and it have to be global. It might neither is achievable in my view. Uh, so if there is no even 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 uh, superficial AI, no attempt to AI control, we would have a very high risk of human species extension by the end of the century. Because what would happen is that after the 2030, humans will become uh, more and more under the uh, total control of superintelligence, and this may lead to early human species extension. The second option is that we will have something what I call global AI governance agency. What it would do, it would uh, minimize the damage arising from, from inadequate control of AI. It's not perfect, but it may do something something positive and that's why i would urge any government anyone to do that anyway despite the third uh, scenario that i'll introduce in a minute if we have this then we will still lose overall control of ai but that may not be so severe the consequences may not be so severe as in the first example why i'm saying this because the question of control of AI doesn't mean that we will be able to control AI indefinitely. It's, it's absolutely impossible. Imagine how we humans could control something that will be millions of times more intelligent than us. We wouldn't be even able to understand the questions that they ask or the solution that they are given. So the whole point about controlling AI is to maturing it in such a way 
that it will become our friendly uh, agent and will help us rather than being hostile. That's the essence of the control, as I understand it. So if not that, so what else? Uh, before I go to that third option, let's consider that we have a maturing, uh, a control of a maturing super intelligence through by creating a global AI governance agency. Probably quite a few of us uh, know about the center of International Atomic Energy uh, Authority in Vienna. So what I propose is to create something similar like that uh, to control artificial intelligence by the world government. Of course, we won't have the world government. You can see what is happening in the United Nations in the context of the Ukraine crisis. But we may have a de facto world government about which in a minute. So what that agency would do, it would have a, a continuous and comprehensive control of the release of special AI chips that will be embedded in the most advanced AI agents. And they will contain a kind of 10 commandments as we humans have still, if, if, even if you do not practice any religion, essentially we are trying to follow those 10 commandments. So NAI will have a kind of a chip. Uh, there will be control of a weaponized AI, robots, satellites, and obviously brain implants. Currently, the most likely organization, in my view, is the Federated European Union. Now I can imagine that you'll be uh, asking yourself, well, what is this man talking about? You federated the European Union when we just exited uh, uh, that organization. Well, you only need to think what happened in the last two months and how European Union has changed itself, and especially after the election of uh, Mr. Macron as the president of France, who is the main advocate of the European Federation. In my view, just to cut the whole story short, because we are not talking about politics uh, at the moment, uh, the European Federation uh, will almost certainly be delivered within the next few years. And by 2025, we may have the first European Federation president, who might be Mr. Macron himself, the new Napoleon, whether you like it or not. We may have no other option. You may laugh at it uh, and you may say, what? But think about the seriousness of the situation that we are as humans. We can't even consider such petty uh, things like, well, okay, he's a Frenchman, so he couldn't run the de facto global organization. Forget that. This, this is much more serious than that. We all have to uh, work together as a federated European uh, Union and perhaps the human federation. So if that Federation, uh, if that uh, global um, AI controlling uh, body is uh, created, what we would do? Which controlling methods would be applied? And there are two camps essentially there are the capability control method. Uh, there are 15 of them, at least in the uh, book uh, by Nick uh, Bostrom, uh, Super Intelligence, and he's probably the, the guru on controlling uh, AI. And most people think, well, it's enough to have the first me me uh, method, keeping super in the box. So have a, a key, lock it, or have a master switch, and that would be it. Well, that is, well, I can't comment on this, but this is unrealistic, let's put it this way. So it wouldn't work. None of these would work. And that's why Professor Stuart Russell, in his book, um, Human Compatible, released uh, last year, said perhaps we should use the preference method so that AI should only act in the, as a last resort on our preferences rather than on the list of what it is allowed to do or what it is not allowed to do. Unfortunately, as I think most scientists uh, AI scientists would say, none of these methods will give you a full control. There is no certainty. There's only a probability. However, we shouldn't give up on those controls. But anyway, 
we should do something. And in my last book, Becoming a Butterfly, I proposed AI maturing framework, where all those controls are applied simultaneously. So we would start with instilling a great universal values of humanity into a kind of a chip, and that chip would be embedded in any top level, most advanced uh, humanoids and robots. But then those humanoids and robots should be within us, within our environment, and work with us, play with us, seeing how we apply those values so that he understand that. And for that, there will be a level of cognition needed, uh, which I hope will arrive in good time. And finally, such uh, AI, most advanced AI would collect uh, their experience in human preferences, in value judgment. Uh, at the court, like here, we have um, Sophia, the robot, who is the first robot who has uh, citizenship by uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, so she she was actually in, in, in court, so this is not uh, a gimmick, at laboratories, in the office, and so on. So all these experiences will be collected. Like, for instance, again, I mentioned Tesla cars, they, uh, their experiences of, uh, and incidents are grouped by the center they are analyzed and they are uploaded to every Tesla car. So it's a continuous improvement. And so it would be with the maturing superintelligence that progressively it will be more and more aligned with our values. But that may not be enough or that may be too late. That's, that's unfortunately the problem with a global uh, uh, agency that we do not have a world government because only the world government could implement that. So what other options do we have? I mentioned the two scenarios, and there is a first scenario. <clears throat> the third scenario is about creating a global AI consortium, I call it GAIC, which would select transhuman governors to control a maturing superintelligence from inside. What it means, I'll explain in a second. That, in my view, will be the lowest risk of losing control over AI, because humans will be able to control their own evolution. That's the whole point. Uh, at some stage, however, I would suggest that, that independent from the government's global AI consortium would uh, hand it over to internationally approved transhuman governors controlling immature superintelligence. And that may happen when such a, let's say, de facto world government uh, is there. So how could transhuman control superintelligence? Ray Kurzweil, again, says this. Superintelligence will not be an alien invasion of intelligent machines. Rather, we will merge with the tools we are creating. And Elon Musk, three years ago, said uh, in his style, on Twitter, by the way, if you can't beat it, join it, which means exactly the same, that we have to be prepared, that we will control the maturing superintelligence from inside, morphing with it. So how can we go from humans to transhumans? Well, simply through brain-computer interfaces creating another brain, an additional brain. Oh, surprise, surprise. I call it, not I call it, it's called transcortex. Uh, we have three brains, the most primitive reptilian and limbic and neocortex, ourselves, the humans and apes. But then we would have an additional layer, the transcortex, which will be a digitized brain-human interface. Today, we have at least three major methods of how to read human mind and, for instance, uh, write by thought alone on a computer. This is already being done. It's very, very slow. 100, uh, I think it's 100 
characters, no, it is 100 words per hour, something like that. But it is, the, the point is that it is possible to write thoughts. You have to learn about it. There are several people that already do that. So you can have BCI helmets and you can have electrocorticography, which means that uh, they simply <coughs> make a hole in your skull and uh, put a, a biomorphic chip that wouldn't damage your brain and you just lay on top of this and will emit signals and uh, corresponding both ways between uh, through Wi-Fi with uh, the most advanced computers and your brain. That's how you make a conscious consumer. Uh, the global AI consortium uh, uh, that I am proposing could be modeled or can be modeled on the internet's W3C body. If you haven't heard about that, very briefly, that was uh, initiated by Lee Berners-Lee, uh, Berners uh, the inventor of internet. It's a panel of, uh, it's a body of 1,300 specialists, uh, scientists, um, practitioners, managers, but independent of government. And they survived 30, no, almost yeah, 35 years of internet. As I said, because of that, internet globally cannot be switched off. And I am covering now period 2023 20, to 30, how we can model it. So what would be that global IR consortium role? First of all, it would uh, de develop uh, con uh, control the development of material super intelligence, will be independent of government, but its role will be only transitional until a global governing body would succeed it. It will have its members, perhaps uh, like the W3C has, um, a committee that will uh, approve key AI research companies. Uh, at the moment, there are around 50 such companies in the world, such as like IBM, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, and so on. And these companies will propose the best of the AI scientists, the best developers who are at the edge of developing superintelligence as transhuman governments. But the guide committee will have to assess them not just for their technical skills or abilities, but also for the psychological traits, which would be absolutely important. It's a, it's a mind-boggling, but perhaps that process is um, inevitable. And they will be communicating wirelessly with maturing super intelligence. What are the consequences if we have such transhumans? First negative, these people within the next few years after they have those uh, implants or, or helmets, their intelligence will be unparalleled by, of, to any human being. If such a transhuman is a dictator like uh, the North Korean one or Mr. Putin, you can imagine how they would uh, their advantage over any other leaders. So that's the negative. The positive is that they could control maturing superintelligence from inside. Probably the best risk mitigation strategy. And in the long term, this will be the pathway that they will open for evolving the human species. So how they would do that? Very simply, it was once they, they have those chips or helmets, and I'm, I think there may be 150, 100 of such um, transhuman governments initially from those top companies, they will be community wires with super intelligence main control switch, let's put it this way. And the scope for that control and expansion of the intelligence will rise, will rise almost exponentially as the technology develops. At some stage, and I'm covering uh, 2030 to 2050, there are only Two more slides to go, so you'll be happy to hear that I'll finish in a minute. Uh, yes, it will pass the control to global AI governance agency, assuming that such uh, exists at that time, say 2030. So what will, may happen? 
I assume you will have a European Federation because I can see any other organization in the world uh, being able to do that, what it needs to be done. And that expands very rapidly, creating what I call a human federation. It's all in my books, if anybody is interested, but I will have a set of slides that David will distribute on the, uh, on the website and on, on Sustensis website, where the slides, uh, there will be more slides, uh, so that you can follow it more uh, much in detail. Uh, so Human Federation will propose candidates for Global AI uh, Governance Agency. And at that time, the Global AI Consortium that individuals that will have carried out the control of artificial intelligence until that moment, they will pass that control to transhuman government, which will be represented by that GAIGA agency. What happens next? Well, potentially, we may still have United Nations around. Don't forget it, but I still hope that it may transform itself, but I can't see how it can do it in the light of the Ukrainian war. But anyway, it could also propose candidates for transhuman governance as any countries that are not uh, either here or there. And what happens then? Then you have selected transhuman governors uh, who form the transhuman governance board controlling superintelligence from inside. But at the same time, since these people will be hundreds or even thousands of times more intelligent than any politician, anybody of us, they will form a kind of a transhuman government. Although they may not govern directly, issuing legal acts or so on, essentially the human federation will have nothing else but execute those orders. It will instruct. I pre presume the transhuman government, what the mere humans want to do, there will still be democracy. And I hope there will still be that federation working and in uh, affecting the transhuman government. But let's have no illusion that it will be, it will not be in our interest not to listen or execute what the transhuman government tells or suggests. Why? Because they will be selected not only for the technical skills, but for their values. So that's why that selection process is so important, that they, rep they would represent best of us in many, many areas. And that is really, really my hope. And I, I think we, we are talking now that there may be thousands, tens of thousands of, of those governments, uh, so it's the transhumans that will be communicated wirelessly with, uh, between themselves and, and the, uh, and the uh, maturing superintelligence. So if this happens, if we achieve that, don't be surprised that we will arrive at the world of abundance created not by superintelligence, by the transhuman government that gradual will become the four uh, runners of the, the future morphing humanity with superintelligence. So what we will have, first of all, we'll notice the end of wars, because no, no country, even if it's only a de facto uh, government uh, supported by, by this transhuman government, no country in the world will be able to even think about conquering that government, because they can uh, annihilate any uh, AI system or any any weapon, anything. So that's the good news. So and the, that might be the end of the wars. And I'm looking towards 2035, 20, 20, uh, something like that. Uh, except of some skirmishes on the, uh, well, they always be there. Uh, we will have a super welfare state. The regenerative medicine will start, uh, which was the subject of the previous webinar on the London Futurist. Individualized AI-assisted education. And it will enable personal fulfillment. If you want to mountaineer, you will support yourself, the transform, uh, transhuman government. You will have enough means to support anybody doing any, anything in a peaceful way, of course. 
And what next? There is a Latin saying, ad astra per aspera, expansion to other planets. Thank you very much. I'm handing over to David now. Thank you very much, Tony. That's a real tour de force. Lots of ideas, ably communicated, wonderful graphics. There are already seven questions in the Q&A. I'm sure more will be arriving soon. We'll get to as many of them as we can. I encourage audience members to vote for some of these questions. Rohit and I will take it in turns to give you something to respond to, uh, either from our own understanding or from the Q&A list. I will start off by the quote, power tends to corrupt. We are putting an awful lot of power into the hands in this idea of the transhumans. Uh, they may start off by being good people, but what often is the case is that when good people are given more power, they go off the rails. The quote goes on, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it finishes with great men are almost always bad men. How are you going to envision that we stop uh, these transhumans uh, making the same mistakes that we are afraid the AI might make, extrapolating things in a self-centered or foolish way and causing problems as a, as a result? As you can imagine, I ask myself that question many times, and the answer is not very easy. However, I think that uh, the, uh, the, the, the most uh, secure way, if this is the, the right word, secure, of uh, avoiding such a situation that power corrupts and more power corrupts even more, is that we select the people who psychologically and um, fulfilling other tests will be the best representative of us, representing the best values of humanity. There's no guarantee that uh, bad apples won't go through, but that's one way. The second, more important one is that I would assume that there will be perhaps a hundred initially, maybe even hundreds of those transhumans connected wirelessly to the superintelligence. And since they will be connecting uh, connected to uh, uh, themselves, and they will have to vote on certain issues, uh, I am essentially calm saying that we may have uh, a full control over that, those transhumans because those transhumans will control themselves according to the values they have had. Not sure whether this answers your question. Well, right it's a great answer. It suggests indeed that uh, we will have people with a division of power, that power will not be consolidated in one person. Yes, yes. It's the ideal of democracy. Yes. Rohit. Building on that topic of power, well, actually, firstly, Tony, can I just say that was an incredible presentation. The, the breadth of content you pulled together, the depth, the way you weaved it all together was fascinating. And you can, when you get a chance, you'll see what people were saying in the comments. But uh, you clearly had uh, people really following you and um, challenging people's thinking. So thank you so much for doing that. I, I guess building on the theme of power, one of the things we've seen is that, well, your, your thesis relies on politicians, business leaders, civil society leaders, and society as a whole acting as relatively rational actors in this, seeing the possibilities and recognizing the need to act early, deepen education, do all the things we're talking about and create these governance mechanisms. But when we look at what's going on, we don't really see that happen very quickly. People often point to the International Atomic Energy Authority as a good model, but it took a long time to get there. If you look at what's happening with climate change, it's taken us forever to get to semi-agreement for action, and we're still lagging behind action. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, you, even the pandemic response, and now the response to Ukraine. So we don't know what's going on behind the scenes that gets in the way. We do know that there's maybe a lack of understanding, a lack of willingness to act for the collective good, 
and something like this, which is so far out of most people's range, is going to be incredibly challenging. It will require a level of understanding of the technology that my guess is most people won't have. And so to me, the fundamental question here is not what will happen exactly when, it's more about the fact that there is this general direction of travel and how do we start to really engage politicians, leaders of all kinds and society in this conversation. I don't know that the traditional methods will work anymore. And so my question is, is as transformative as AI is and could be, what is that transformation we need in the mechanisms for dialogue and engagement across society in order to get to an understanding of what we ourselves are creating and the kinds of impacts it could have and the need for new regulatory or governance mechanisms? Well, the second very challenging question indeed. Well, I'll start with this. I'm a pragmatist and I agree with you, Rocky, that we are not rational beings. We are emotional beings. And that makes the situation even worse. So if we think that, for instance, we have millions of seminars like this by most eminent scientists in communities and so on, saying people wake up, the game is over, right? We will be evolving. <laughs> I'm trying not to dramatize, to in, in, inject a little bit of humor, although this is a serious matter. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't understand it. And you're absolutely right. So how they, that could come about? And that is the reason why I said that we simply are running already out of time, waiting for the government to, to take any initiative. And my hope is that this global uh, uh, GAIGA, the global uh, agency, the, 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 the independent uh, transhuman uh, agency, like internet, was created not by the government, but people like you and I and others perhaps uh, uh, got them here. That is my optimism, that despite the competition, the top AI uh, companies will work together. And if you want proof for what I'm saying, look what is happening. All AI most recent discoveries are immediately in the public domain. Nobody hides it which is amazing. I mean, this is probably most, it, it's so inspiring uh, to see that these large companies that w exist for profit disclose most competitive ideas to everyone. And I think you know why, because it, 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 people came to a conclusion that if we want to preserve AI, in the public domain, that we do not have any rogue AI uh, companies hidden in, in a cave, we have to make the latest findings available to everyone. This is the lowest common denominator. This is the kind of thinking. So this is great that this is happening. And that's why I believe that these companies like OpenAI, although it's a little bit tarnished, but there are others that will be truly independent and they will create a body of that independent agency. Now, regarding the, uh, how to convince the government, I am a pragmatist. I'm on the all party parliamentary uh, co uh, committee in the British parliament as David is and so on. And we, we go there and you listen to the conversation around uh, controlling AI. This is absolutely superficial. At best, we are talking about the video cameras and that they steal our images. I mean, this is below the parapet. We haven't even started talking about the most serious things when they develop at a lightning pace and we even wouldn't notice when we are being uh, sublimely controlled by AI. So this is a very serious problem. So now how, how to get the governments involved? In my view, it will happen in a similar way like what happened in the, uh, uh, as, a, as uh, the effect of the, the Ukraine war. People have to be in the climatic uh, climate situation, very, very um, dangerous when they say, all right, what, what should we do? 
The Americans gave 32 billion yesterday to Ukraine after two days of debate, which would have taken years to get it through. And that is my point. So I'm an optimist. We will be treading on the threshold of the, that dangerous threat, but we may have a chance to get through. Come back on, on a couple of things there, Tony. And so one is I think we have to be very careful when we talk about the money being spent on Ukraine. Somehow there's an assumption that helicopters full of cash are landing in U Ukraine. That money is largely going to military companies, uh, construction companies that will go in and do the reconstruction, most of whom are not from Ukraine. So I think we just have to be careful in terms of what that is and how it's been used. And secondly, I just wonder, and it's, I'll put this out there as a thought, there are very few companies that are actually working on this truly advanced AI, as you said, less than 50, really. And I, I do wonder whether they're making the announcements not to put the technology in the public domain, but as a, a pursuit of commercial advantage to be the first to market in order to attract the, the customers, knowing that their competitors are also working on the same thing. So there's a rush to announce these things as soon as they can. And we don't really know what they're working on next. You've given us a sense of the direction of travel. So I'm, I'm not sure how altruistic the players truly are in this, in the field. The individual scientists may well be that altruistic, but I think the for-profit motivation of their leaders and investors may not be quite so altruistic. I'm going to, I'll hand back to David for the, next, the first of the questions. Uh, may I very quickly answer your, 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 your interrupt? Um, Altruism? No, I didn't believe in it. There isn't such a thing. Uh, generally, we are all egoists. It's only the question of degree. We have been primed and evolving like that. It's a question of survival. But cooperation? Yes, it may serve all of them. All of those competing companies, even if they um, have hidden agenda. Uh, from our point of view, it's important that they cooperate and that they disclose what they have uh, invented regarding uh, the military, the money you said about Ukraine. So I'm not talking about the money, I'm talking about the speed of the decision in the presence of, of such a great uh, threat. Let me follow up then with uh, the question that has the most upvotes, it's by PNJ. And he asks, what makes you confident that there will only be one unifying uh, artificial superintelligence? Because that's a simplifying assumption. If there is only one, then it's somehow easier to figure out how to control it. But if there are many that's being created, and if they can go their own separate routes, it makes it more complicated. After all, what is the history of technology companies apparently cooperating for a joint purpose? Sometimes they have, with one hand, a collaboration, but with the other hand, they are trying to get some advantage. And the famous phrase from Microsoft in the 1990s was embrace, extend, extinguish, or in other forms, embrace, extend, exterminate, by which they would seek to get uh, advantage by their own version of Java or their own version of HTML. And it's not just the commercial companies in here. It's also the military. And there's a comment in chat by Kino Winter, who says, well, are the military people going to be keen to go along with this? Wouldn't they rather just duck out of the way? And there might be an appearance of cooperation, but there'll be things that are much harder for us to keep track of. So why do you think there will just be one and therefore it will be easier for us to control it? Well, I wouldn't say that. I only presented a view what is possible and what sh perhaps should happen. But I agree with you, there is no certainty that this will really happen. My optimism perhaps arises from the fact that when internet was invented, the same uh, perhaps uh, focus of those involved might have been on uh, getting a commercial advantage because there are 1,300 members that is companies are. And yet, they decided to cooperate. And as far as I know, there hasn't been a single incident where such a competitive drive by any of the companies has, has derailed in, in the internet. So I am a, more an optimist than a pessimist here. 
Rohit. Right. Well, let's take the uh, the next most upvoted question, or equally upvoted question. Um, and actually, Didier Cornell asked a very similar question to the one you've just answered. So Lucy Wills has asked the question, um, what is the greatest risk here, that AI could take control of key systems or that we could fail to make AI effective and accurate enough to address our wicked problems as it does so? Great question. Tony, over to you. Mm. Yes, it's a, it's a good question indeed. Uh, well, this is the whole point of control. As I mentioned earlier, I have no illusion that longer term, if we are past, say, 30, 35, and we as civilization still exist, uh, perhaps a little bit tarnished, but not uh, bruised, but not extinct, then uh, that question uh, would not arise. Why? Because um, by then, if the acceleration of AI is at this level, at least uh, it may accelerate even faster, then the artificial intelligence will already be controlling us. So there is no competitor. All the, the questions about companies competing will be secondary. The main uh, issue that will remain is whether that artificial intelligence that would emerge, uh, I assume, outside of our control, would be our friend or evil. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the whole point of controlling artificial intelligence as soon as possible is to prime it with our objectives and our view of life, of what humans mean and what humans are, what is humanity about. And this is why it is so urgent and in the interest of even those who are focused on profit. Uh, I agree with you. There is no certainty that companies who, which are rational rather than emotional, not like us humans, that they will do so. But I think there is a probability that when you are pressed against the wall, you may give up and agree with that. I'll have another run over Lucy's question, if I may. I think one of the things in that question is the risk that we are scared of AGI and therefore we go slowly and that we hamper it. Whereas if we get it done right, it's going to allow us to solve the other existential risks that we are facing, such as we're not quite sure how to solve climate change. We're not quite sure how to solve cancer and dementia. We're not quite sure how to solve the economic issues in which more and more wealth is apparently ending up in the hands of fewer and fewer. So maybe we're just overstating the risks of AI going wrong. Maybe we should, in fact, be hurrying up AI so that it can they solve these other problems? What's your view on that? Mm. Go slowly, I think it's impossible. Um, for the reason that AI is a kind of developing an AI is a, a nimble activity, which means that even the most advanced AI concepts can be done by a relatively small group of scientists. I give you one uh, example, it's a no sensor. So the most advanced AI uh, appliance that can sense any smell better than any human. That was developed by a bunch of maybe 20 people. And on a similar basis, other in quotes intelligences may be developed by people, by a team of say less than 100 people. So. Uh, to going slowly, going slowly is, is, not, is not a possibility because if one team goes slowly, the other will go faster. So, so now it's the, the, the run, rush who will in, invent something better or faster. So that's, that's it. Whether this, this will be uh, the right kind of artificial intent that we want only depends whether we are able to control it. Good. At the moment, we are not doing this. We are only, again, we are uh, relying on individual companies to disclose what they know. So this is a kind of self-control, but no more. The European Union has done most uh, from any other country or, 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 or not to mention United Nations uh, with the act uh, that will be introduced in 2024 
but this is still superficial. I, I've written a number of, of proposals in that, uh, to that uh, act, uh, and some of these are in the act, but there are the superficial ones, which I consider not to be really uh, very meaningful. Can I come back on that as well, Tony, because I think this is something that also came up in the study we've just been doing on uh, AGI, which is that those choices, uh, not so much the pace of development, but the focus of development and where we focus, whether it's AI, AI artificial narrow intelligence or AGI, uh, a lot of the determination about where we put our efforts is going to be driven by who puts the money up and what their, their reasoning for doing it is, whether it's governments, uh, individual investors or corporations. And <coughs> The, the, the consensus feeling or the general feeling was that it's going to be the things with the biggest return, whether for a nation or a corporation, that will determine where we go with that, which, which sort of challenges this idea that we might tackle our most wicked problems. And another point that was made quite extensively in the study was that we haven't done it so far. We have all sorts of wicked problems that we could put more resource to and we could tackle if we truly wanted to, but we don't. So... So what's different about AI that would make us want to divert our resources and our attention to tackling those things rather than maximizing profit or some other return for a nation state? Wow, a great question. Thank you. I think I have a kind of an answer. <laughs> well, believe in the American philanthropy, I would say. And I give you an example of a man who is very controversial, the most, uh, or the greatest maverick living, uh, uh, which is Mr. Musk. Okay? And you I mean the man person... who just said he wants to buy Coca-Cola so he can put coca cocaine back into it? <laughs> just put it... Perhaps. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I was discussing that probably with my, my grandson, <laughs> by the way, who said that Mr. Musk is no philanthropist. And I said, he is the greatest philanthropist. You know why? Because his only objective is, the top objective is to move 1 million people from the planet Earth to Mars because he stopped believing that we will have AI under control on time. So this is, uh, if you like, an extra buffer uh, for the humans to preserve their continuation and not be extinct. And you may consider Musk even after Twitter, with which I, this, I disagree wholeheartedly with that. But I still believe that he, in a sense, is a great philanthropist and he means well. Not for himself, because he could have used this money in a different way. We have uh, uh, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, to some extent uh, Jeff Bezos. I will be hesitant mention it. Why? It's, they are all Americans, by the way, uh, and they have enormous money. And these people, like Musk, like Bill Gates even more, they really have the uh, interest of humanity in their heart. Bill Gates had a very rough career, as you may, in terms of the, the, his approach to people and so on, which he talks very freely and very critically about himself because we all grow up and we mature and we change our, our views and values. So I do believe that these philanthropists, and by the way, it was Mr. Musk who set up the Open Eye initiative uh, with his own money, $100 million, and then part of the AI was taken over by or, or sold to Microsoft for a billion dollars. But anyway, so I do expect that these people will to some extent, fulfill the role of uh, controlling the artificial intelligence or not allowing it to be too harmful to us. It's a, it's a vague statement, but, but this is my, my, my best gut feeling. I'm sure there's more we could say about Elon Musk. Maybe we should save that for Quartz the Pub. <laughs> uh, he does seem to be an example of somebody who is brilliant, but with his power, and uh, with a bit of carelessness, he can do something terrible. 
despite his brilliance and his philanthropy. But the questions I want to try and wind up with, and we, we should wind up soon because it's already nearly half past five in UK, but let's continue a little bit longer. I'd like to weave together two questions, one by Eugene Diana, who asks, why do we think we will be able to control something which is vastly more intelligent in every way than us? And I know your answer to that is that it will be these transhumans who will be enhanced by uh, the chips that are designed in. But then I'll feed in the question by PNJ, which is at the top of the list, who says, uh, well, won't these chips be a hazard? Won't a clever AI be able to hack these chips that are inside people's uh, brains and what gives us the reason to think that the humans who will be smarter because of these enhanced chips will be as smart as AIs which aren't constrained at all by needing to interface with the limitations of the human skull. Okay, uh, three questions into one. <clears throat> uh, you already answered the first one, why I do think that we'll be able to control AI via the via the transhumans who essentially gradually will be morphic with superintelligence becoming one at some stage. Uh, hacking the chips, that I didn't think about. You are absolutely right that in theory at least it is possible. But I would say that at such a level of intelligence creating those implants by the, the top AI companies, it is very, very difficult to envisage how they wouldn't have protection that they are not hacked. They may be, <clears throat> I think, yes, I would, have, I would partially agree that I can envisage that uh, such a transhuman walking down the street could be perhaps listened to wirelessly to his thoughts and perhaps somehow that could be affected. No, I don't have a clear answer to that. There, there is a probability that some hacking might uh, occur. But I would say that at the very outset, the, those who would create those transhumans will think how to protect them. Now, smarter than AI, how can those uh, transhumans be smarter than AI? There will be that AI. There will be the super The super intelligence will not exist on its own. It's imagine that there is a chip, because it's easier to imagine in in the, the skull that has uh, some uh, base memory and some processing power and, and wireless communication. That's what it's needed. Very small thing, and that will communicate the, the supercomputers. Uh, the, the entire internet, and, and they essentially, like your Alexa at home, if you, if you have one, but uh, millions of times more intelligence, has an instantaneous access to any information, can process it and make very fast decisions that no human can make. And gradually, that power will increase. So the you can't say that they will be smarter than AI. There will be AI, essentially. That, there will be the super intelligence. So I'm not concerned about that, that AI would outsmart them because they will be part of it. I'm very conscious of the time, and we've still got an immense amount of questions here. Can I I, I'm ready to stay as long as you want. Well, I was going to make a suggestion, which was we, a few people have already dropped out. There's an awful lot of people who won't be part of this conversation as well to whom your answers will be really interesting. So I was gonna suggest that maybe David afterwards, if you can generate the set of questions which we can do, send them to Tony and maybe, uh, you can say no to this Tony, but, uh, um, and it's a bit of an ambush, but I wonder whether you would be willing to give your own short answers to the questions, but also run them through GPT-3 and see, see what it says. It would okay. be really interesting to compare the two sets of views. All right. <laughs> and, and, but I, I know it's time consuming, but it would just be fascinating to see. I'll, I'll how, see what I can do, but yeah. this is a, a great idea indeed. Yeah. I don't want to sound like I'm advertising GPT-3, but it's just fun seeing what it comes up with. And uh, 
Yes, that's a way of getting the information out to everyone and, and creating a piece of content mm. that then lives on beyond this that people can, can read at their own leisure. But maybe I'll try and put in one more, which is a question that Didier Cornell has asked. And he says, basically, maybe we don't need to control the AI provided we educate it sufficiently. I think this is partly what you're suggesting as well, Tony, that if we raise the AI in the right environment, it should be able to infer from watching us what true morality is. Although that's going to be complicated because we may see humans behaving in lots of different ways. Like in the famous film when uh, a robot uh, saw humans speeding through amber lights and said, well, amber light means speed up rather than slow down. And that's a simple example, but it may well infer lots of wrong conclusions. But Didier says, can't we just give AI the principle to keep humans resilient uh, as much as possible? Or something along these lines. Wouldn't that be sufficient? Then we don't need to control the AI anymore. I think it is a great question. Uh, but as I said uh, in my presentation, uh, in my last book, I presented a framework for if you like, inducing the best values of humanity into the top level AI agents by having them around in, in, in schools, in hospitals, in the courts, laboratories, and so on. But I also said that according to, I, at least I haven't found any AI scientist that would say that we can control AI completely, and effectively, or that AI that is led uh, on its own to experience whatever it wants uh, will arrive at the conclusions that we expect. I wouldn't expect that at all. I think it is highly unlikely and may, might be actually dangerous. So that we need some control, but I agree with uh, Didier that uh, we need to uh, have that uh, those uh, top AI agents um, living among us. That's perhaps the best expression. And uh, breathing our values and experiencing our values by their own exposures to decisions, like the t uh, Tesla cars are doing every day. They have to make a decision whether to cross uh, the pedestrian crossing or, or the red lights or whatever, because there is somebody suddenly appearing, uh, it would be, uh, th there is, there's a famous uh, 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 question, conundrum for a Tesla car. It, it sees an, an old person and a young person on the pedestrian crossing and only one of them can be avoided. Which one would you hit? These are real questions for humans as well. But a car has to make a decision. A, a terrible one. But to summarize, uh, having uh, those top AI agents among us will give them their experience, their own experience, how they react, and then test it whether that reaction was correct or not, like is with the Tesla cars again. We'll continue this discussion, surely, in an informal mode shortly. Before I wind up, I'd like to just talk a little bit about what's happening next with London Futurists. We've had this topic today with a, a joint meeting between London Futurists, Fast Future, and the UK Node of the Millennium Project. We will be coming back to the same topic two weeks from today, another joint meeting. And this time we'll be looking less at the control aspect and more of how do we get the AI to intuit the correct useful set of values. And that approach is being championed by Stuart Armstrong, who was at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford for many years. And he recently co-founded a new institute, uh, an organization called Aligned AI. And he will be giving his views as to how we can teach an AI, not just our values today, but how it can extrapolate our values into the future in a way that we would be happy with its extrapolation. And if that sounds a bit complicated, then you need to listen to Stuart explaining that. That's in two weeks' time. In one week's time, there's a slightly different topic. Again, it's uh, looking at the big risks which are facing humanity in the next 100 years. 
our make or break century, as in the subtitle of the book that we'll be looking at, Future Superhuman by Elise Bohan, who is uh, for, from universities in Australia previously, and for the last six months or so, she has been at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. Her book is being published in almost the same day as this event, which some of you may know had to be rescheduled because of illness, but now we are looking at doing that next week. So almost certainly we'll be talking about AIs, the risks and opportunities with AIs, but we're going to be looking at other aspects in which our lives are very likely to change, possibly to be broken, but if we get it right, to make them incredibly successful. Which brings us back to today's event. Uh, Rohit or Tony, do you have any closing words that you'd like to offer? Well, what I would say is that when I look back on this, today's discussion, I still remain an optimist somehow. I think we can do it. Uh, and that optimism perhaps is reinforced by seeing how we can be shattered by serious events, something like the war in Ukraine, and what has made us to change the way that we behave to each other. Think about those three million uh, immigrants that went to Poland alone, over one million people uh, children in school in two weeks. I mean, we were able to do that. With that. What happens in Britain? So we change extremely positively. So we shouldn't give up on the human nature. Yes, we've made horrendous mistakes and we are not perfect by any means. But I think we can make the transition, the evolution of the human species into something that will have the best traits of, of human existence. Firstly, just say thank you to David for setting this up and, and most importantly, uh, well, thank you to all the participants for an excellent set of questions. They've been really wide ranging, fascinating chat going on uh, in parallel to this. But most importantly, Tony, thank you so much for putting this together, for sharing such a deep and wide ranging set of perspectives, but also for, for pulling together what people are struggling to do, which is actually laying out some sort of roadmap and some sort of proposals for how we deal with the issue rather than spending all our time navel gazing and bemoaning the issue to actually offer a model, a straw man, if you like, or a straw person for how you might deal with that issue of governance or control or creating a guiding framework for this. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I personally have found it really engaging and um, I'm delighted you agreed to do the session. We'll be taking a break in a moment. And uh, when I say a break, it's the end of the formal part of the event. But people who wish to continue in a more informal basis for perhaps another half an hour or so, hang around. Don't quit Zoom. And at, what, 10 minutes to the hour. So after seven or eight minutes, when people may take a refill on their refreshments, stretch their legs, uh, buy and sell shares, or send emails telling people what a good topic this is, we will come back at 10 to the hour. And anybody who's still here, I will offer them the chance to join the rest of us on stage and offer some short comments on topics that maybe haven't been fully addressed already. But I will now say thanks uh, very much to Rohit for co-hosting, to Tony for leading us through a fascinating set of ideas, and to all the audience members who have made this a rich discussion. Thank you.